This week's episode is sponsored by uh, somebody new for us. It's Splice.com. They have an amazing product that allows you to do collaborative work over the internet, uh, working with people. I currently am working with a collaborator out in California. We're doing some neat work together, and it really wouldn't be possible to do what we're doing if it wasn't for Splice. Uh, Splice has got a cool system where you can have access to plugins that you might otherwise not be able to afford. Uh, they have an amazing sounds library that's available. Uh, there's a really cool community behind it, including a lot of downloadable projects that you get to try your hand at remixing. All in all, it's a lot of fun, and we're really excited to have them as a sponsor. Now, one of the things that you can do uh, for the podcast is get over there and sign up and show your support by uh, using our promo code. So you would first of all go to splice.com and uh, then go to slash artmusictech-music. I'll have a link on the webpage if you need it. But again, it's splice.com slash artmusictech, T-E-C-H, dash music. And then um, if you want to sign up for Splice Sounds, which is their... Uh, million sample sound library there's some really cool stuff there i got a chance to go for a little deep dive on it it was a lot of fun um you can use the promo code music art tech that's m-u-s-i-c-a-r-t-t-e-c-h that'll get you a free month and that'll give you a chance to uh, check out what they're doing again it's really worth the effort as is the whole product line as is their site i find it really uh, an important part of what the future looks like. If you listen to my podcast at all, you know that I'm a big fan of um, of working in collaboratively with others. I always find that people that work in collaborations do some of their most amazing work as part of a little collaboration. I'm a strong proponent, and I think that this is a tool that can really make it happen for you and uh, in the way that it's working for me. So I hope you enjoy it, and I want to really thank Splice.com for helping bring this really great interview with Curtis Rhodes. All right, this week um, I get to speak to a very a guest that's very special to me. Uh, the fact of the matter is I have uh, a few books here from my library on my desk, uh, and they all share one thing in common. They have uh, this gentleman's name on them. Uh, his name is Curtis Rhodes. The book are... Uh, the Computer Music Journal, Microsound, and Composing Electronic Music, three of his uh, really well-known texts. Um, I am so excited to, to speak with, with Curtis, and so I'll stop talking and let's talk to him. Hey, Curtis, how's it going? Good. How are you? I'm great. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your schedule to have this chat. I really appreciate it. Sure. Why don't we start off, for people who don't know maybe a lot about you, let's, let's have you uh, talk about what you consider sort of your current work. Well, I'm a composer of electronic music, and I've written a number of books on the topic, both the technology and the aesthetic aspects of it. And, and uh, I've done research in the field and developed software by myself and with others. So that's the general area of my activity. The books that you talk about are really sort of like some of the fundamental texts for people that are into exploratory uh, electronic and computer music. I mean, uh, you, you know, the first text of yours that I r ran across, I, I don't know, is it your first book, The Computer Music Tutorial? Uh, no, there were several others before oh, that. Okay, but that was the one that that caught me, and it caught me at a at a really peculiarly important time in my life, which was when I wanted to dive into computer music techniques, and it was an uh, encyclopedic opportunity for me to get engaged. But also it was through that that I was introduced to the Computer Music Journal, which I know you've had a long, uh, a long interaction with. And then shortly thereafter, Microsound came out, and it, it seems like you have been pushing the envelope for me in so many of these areas. Now, this most, the most recent book of yours that I have, which is the Composing Electronic Music book uh, that's out on Oxford Press, it is it's like a masterwork of thought-provoking ways of imagining music. Now, 
I would say that that is sort of a thread that runs through a lot of your work, which is you seem to take the concepts that we all intuit about music and find ways to dive deeper into them. So with microsound, diving deep into the time, the relationship of timing, right? Um, in the in this current book, you actually take apart several different parts of music. What what is it about doing that kind of thing that is that's intriguing to you? It seems to be something that you you naturally gravitate towards. Yeah, well, I think aesthetics is really important, and it's not something that's emphasized generally in American musical education. But I lived in Paris for six years, and that is a place where there's a lot of composers, there's a lot of competition, it's very serious, and people know how to think and explain what they're doing. And I think to be successful in the field, it's important to have your ideas in order. So I wrote the book to get my ideas in order and hopefully to inspire others to uh, follow some of the threads that I can't follow, possibly follow. There are so many of them in the book, right. but I'm, I'm definitely exploring some of them. When we were first talking, you were hoping that your Blu-ray release was going to be available. Did they, has that come out yet? Uh, not not yet, but I've been assured that it is coming out. So that, okay. that's, yeah, I have a Blu-ray release uh, called Flicker Tone Pulse, and it will be coming out from the uh, ZKM, the Center for Art and Technology in Karlsruhe. And it will be on the Blu-ray format. And so as I tell everybody, you'll just have to buy a Blu-ray player. Right. Because nobody, nobody has them. <laughs> I know. Well, actually, you know, yeah, what it turns out is that if you have like one of these like neighborhood uh, uh, websites or something, you can just say, hey, does anyone have a Blu-ray disc player that I could use? And uh, most often you'll find a neighbor who's looking to get rid of one. So okay. <laughs> it ends up being pretty valuable. Now, um the the Blu-ray format uh, certainly implies uh, implies that there's visuals involved too. Yeah, the spectacular videos by Brian O'Reilly. These oh, are okay. all new. It's new. It's new music by me and new new videos by Brian O'Reilly. Oh, that's interesting. How did that collaboration work? Well, Brian and I have been collaborating a long time. I met Brian in Paris. We were both working at the CC Mix, the Zanakis Center for Electronic Music. Uh -huh. I was teaching there, and he was working as a musical assistant. And after I moved to Santa Barbara, to the university here, he came to Santa Barbara and became a student here. He taught a course on making videos, uh, music videos. It was obvious to me that he had a great deal of uh, skill in that area mm -hmm. and talent. And so I asked him to make a video for one of my pieces. And so that's kind of how it works. I compose the music and then uh, I ask him to do something with it. And he has an editing style that's on a frame-by-frame -frame basis, so it's very similar on t in the time scale to the way that I work with sound. Oh, that's interesting. Is it one of those collaborations where it just clicks so much that there isn't, there doesn't have to be a lot of communication in order to make this, in, in order to come up with the final product? Yeah, basically, I love his work, so yeah. I just send it to him. He does something great with it. I mean, I, there's only been one time when I told him to change something. And then there's a, one of my pieces, a, a recent piece called Then, is my longest piece. It's 17 minutes. And I told him I don't want a video for that. It's just, it's, I think, staring at a screen with things changing on a micro time scale for 17 minutes is, is really a, too much. The, the music itself is is really the focus in that piece. Sure, sure. Now, having heard some of your work in the past, I would say that there that that is kind of in my feelings about it. The emotions that it evokes from me is one of you know being very close to being overwhelmed. You know, I think that uh, because of your focus on change and your focus on, I guess it would be I guess it would be manipulation at very minute levels, it's something that it very viscerally affects me. I, I find that I have kind of a physical uh, reaction to it as well as just, you know, a, an intellectual one. Well, I, I think it does, uh, you know, I, I think music in general evokes 
the analogy of a journey, and it does take you somewhere. Mm -hmm. it, as I talk about in my book, there have been studies that show that uh, listening to music also evokes areas of the brain that are sensitive to ideas about body motion. So there's a sense, yeah, there is this uh, physical aspect to it, but it's very concentrated and very detailed. And I think that's part of what leads to the the constant change in, in the sound. Sure. Now, I'm a little curious. Uh, one of the things that's sort of like a common thing that I talk to people about in my podcast is where their where they come from, what their uh, background was that led them to the place that they're at. And when I interact with your, with your written work and when I interact with your compositions as well, one of the things that I find is that there is, is such a level of depth and, and concentration. And now you talk a little bit about being in Paris and there being sort of like this competitive, but also this very focused ad attitude about working with music. I'm wondering what in your background might have prepared you for being, for that being fertile ground for you. Because I think for a lot of people, that kind of place can be intimidating and off-putting. And it sounds to me like you find that a very fertile environment. Yeah, very stimulating. And you definitely had to, ha your game had to come up in right. that environment. And it did. So I really appreciated that, that experience and just hearing a lot of, things and, and meeting all the people making, you know, the, the people at the the GRM, for example, meeting Luc Ferrari, meeting Francois Bale, uh, Bernard Parmigiani, you know, these are people that I've uh, had looked up to for a long time. So, and of course, I was working alongside Zanakis, my former teacher. So, <laughs> yeah, that was all very stimulating to me. It's a great city and yeah. great city for electronic music. Yeah, indeed. Uh, I was there just uh, this last year. I finally got around. To, I can't believe it took me so long. I finally got a chance to go and spend some time at Aircam. And, and again, it's just being in that environment, being around those people and the excitement of creation that's occurring in, in that world, it really gets your like nerve endings firing. You know, it's, it's a pretty amazing thing. Um, how did you get involved in music or sound initially? Uh, did you start off where you like a you know, a grade school band kid, or did you come at it from a different place? No, I was a grade school band kid. I started off with uh, drums, and I played, in, you know, in the school band and things like that. And then I started taking lessons on jazz drumming. And, of course, it was the late 60s, so I joined a couple hundred bands. <laughs> and... Uh, I then after high school, I had no interest in going off to college. I really wanted to just play with the band, so I, I moved into a commune with 25 other people, and you know tried to make it in the music business. And, you know, we had a number of uh, important gigs, but at a certain point, I I had friends that were working at the University of Illinois Experimental Music Studio, and I started going in with them at night and working with the large Moog modular synthesizer. My ideas about music started to grow. I started to listen to new music, contemporary music. And eventually I, I grew out of that pop world. I, I didn't feel comfortable there anymore and right. went off to study uh, composition at California Institute of the Arts. Ah, okay. So normally a, a Cal Arts, well, what, what time frame would that have been that you were at Cal Arts? 1972, I ah, went there. okay. Which just right. opened. Yeah, so who were some of your instructors? Was that like, uh, was that when Morton Spotnik was involved with the program there? Yeah, yeah, sure. And we had the, the large Buchla 200 modular yeah. system, and we had tape recorders. And the other thing that we had was a, that was there was a, a teacher named uh, Leonard Cottrell. Mm -hmm. And Leonard uh, was a mathematician. And we studied uh, mathematics, and I learned com computer programming. So I began programming the computer at CalArts to generate uh, algorithmic music because I had the experience of meeting Zanakis that same year, 1972, and uh, took a short course with him on formalized music. So when I came out of that course, I wanted to go and make computer music. And mm -hmm. uh, that uh, didn't work that well at CalArts. Uh, I didn't get a lot of support for that. And uh, the 
facilities there just weren't powerful enough to synthesize sound. So eventually, after two years, I transferred to the University of California, San Diego, where they had a mainframe computer with the Music 5 program mm -hmm. of Max Matthews. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's where I began my experiments with, with computer-generated sound. So before we follow that trail, I am just... Uh, I am fascinated by the idea that, you know, you kind of got turned on to things by, by Zanakis. I, I, he's one of those people that, that I look at from a distance and it seems almost alien in, in the way that he brought ideas to the table and, and all that stuff. It's, it's hard for me as just kind of a puncher to, to dive into his work and feel like it's it has a connection to the past that I've you know the musical framework that I've developed. What what for you made it so that that was a that was a connection that that was activating? Hmm, that's a complicated question. Yeah, I mean I'm not sure I can answer the question directly as you posed mm -hmm. it, but I mean I can just say that uh, my experience of Zanakis, I was immediately inspired by. His, I mean, I'd heard his work on vinyl, mm -hmm. and I loved it. Mm -hmm. I loved the experimental nature of it. Um, I was very attracted to the idea that um, you have these very intelligent people that are really throwing aside the musical tradition and starting tabula rasa from fundamental scientific principles to, to generate oh, a piece. Yes. I mean, when I heard Ligeti's Volumina, for example... Uh, 1961 piece for organ. It's still one of it's well. That's what inspired me to become a composer of that piece. And if you listen to it, it's 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 these massive sound masses, uh -huh. walls of sound. And this is coming from a composer that ten years earlier was writing, you know, neo romantic. Right. He completely changed his style, and uh, I was very impressed by that. Someone of his intellect and talent would be so radical. And Zanakis was also a radical composer. I'm not. I'm not a radical composer compared to Zanakis, but his radicalness impressed me at the time. And, yeah, and that is an, that's an inspiring that's an inspiring track for sure. So uh, you went down to UCSD and dove into Music Five. Now you were doing programming before then. Working with the Music Five la languages was kind of it, it's kind of a middle ground. It's it's almost like programming uh you know in a language that is music aware in a way right it's aware of sound synthesis graphs mm -hmm. you know of patches mm -hmm. but i wasn't only doing that i mean I, music five in itself was very limiting what i was doing is connecting it to a granular synthesis engine uh. that i wrote in algol oh okay so we had th these programs communicating with one another. So I would generate thousands and thousands of note statements, and then Music 5 would take that and make granular synthesis with it. Oh, I see. Okay. That ex so, so now we're kind of like diving into the sort of work that, that really, I think, defines your, the spine of your work, which is this, uh, this embrace of granular synthesis. What was the precursor work that you were building off of in, in the granular world? Well, Sinakis uh, wrote about it in his book, Formalized Music. Mm -hmm. It's not clear whether he actually did any experiments with it. I met a guy a couple of, well, about five years ago who claims that he was doing experiments with Sinakis around the same time that I was. But I didn't hear about it until five years ago. So uh, in his book, it was a theory. Right, And I'd, I, there was nothing to hear, so I just took the theory and said, well, first of all, I found a, a, what I consider to be a flaw of the theory, which is the, his large-scale grain organization. I said, I've got a, a better idea. We'll just generate these grains in asynchronous clouds rather than on frame boundaries every 40 milliseconds. Mm -hmm. So I just started experimenting with it. But it, the, it, the idea definitely came from Zinakis. It's it's so hard, I think, for people to wrap their head around something that's being being developed, uh, kind of, from an abstract abstract framework into into reality. So one of the things you would have you would have been doing, is literally experimenting with you know what is a grain size that's that's 
viable and useful? What is, right. you mm-hmm. know, what kind of overlaps make sense? Does it make sense right. to do intra, intra grain panning? Is it, you know, where, what are these things? What was like the time frame for the first time you said, Ooh, I have a little program that could make this happen to the point that you felt like you were actually getting something that represented the sound that you were trying to create? Well, really, right off the bat. I mean, the first experiment that I did in in December of 1974, I remember that day very vividly. It was a sunny day. It was not a cold day in La Jolla. I had, uh, the door was open at the Center for Music Experiment. I was sitting in a small room with a PDP-11 computer mm-hmm. and a handmade a digital to analog converter. And I was listening to the sounds and um, I was uh, thrilled. I was excited. It was a breakthrough. That I had heard nothing like it. Yeah. Now, having said that, I think it, maybe another point would be worth stating, and I've written an article about this. Uh, having done those experiments did not mean that I knew what to do with this technique. <laughs> and it took me until... So in 1974, I made these exper- first made these experiments. And in 1998, I figured out what to do with it. <laughs> and it took me that long. Right. Well, it's interesting because reading uh, your this recent book, Composing Electronic Music, I would say that you're still exploring what to do with it. I, oh, I, I get this sense reading the book that I'm kind of watching you not only explain the map that you have, but also reaching out to the boundaries of what the map what the map has. There's many places in the book where you talk about, like, this is an area to be explored. Right. Right. Yeah, there's quite a yeah. There's a it's very exciting all the all the possibilities and uh, yeah. There's plenty. To, I'm making a piece now with granular synthesis, uh, but it uses the Bull and Pierce scale, so it's going to be melodic and harmonic. Mm-hmm. And I have no idea what it's going to sound like. It's right. completely experimental, and I love being in the state of uh, what the Zen people call beginner's mind, where right. I don't know what I'm doing. It's a you know the, the field is open. That's a wonderful place to be as a as an artist, a beginner's mind. So I, I don't know what it's going to sound like, and I'm looking forward to the process. Now, I find that really interesting because that parallels something that, that I certainly feel. I oftentimes like doing working with new processes or working with, I mean, even new equipment or whatever um, because it allows me to it allows me to have that sense of wonder yeah. that's not that that doesn't have the editor fully formed yet right yeah that must be something that that must be something that because of the way that you work you actually run into often yeah i mean in my work there's kind of a back and forth between tilling fields that i've already tilled <laughs> uh, honing the fe- you know honing my technique Sure. And then uh, experiments. The problem with the experimental works is they take years. I mean, I I had this concept about a Bowen and Pierce scale quite a long time ago, and I'll be working. It will take me quite a, a while to figure out. I have not written a textbook on Bowen and Pierce harmony. There isn't a textbook on Bowen and Pierce harmony, so it's something that I'll have to do a lot of experiments and figure out which clouds go with which clouds and in which combinations. So it takes a lot of time, and sometimes it's easier to fire up one of my granulation programs and right. put some sound into it and, and play around with that because it's something I already know. Right. What is the Bull and Pierce scale? Can you explain that a little bit to me? Well, it's a, a scale that's uh, instead of uh, cycling at the octave, the two-to-one ratio, it cycles at the tritove or the oh. three-to-one ratio, an octave and a fifth. Mm-hmm. And then it has 13 tones within it. And maybe the best way to characterize it is to say that it's both more sweet and more sour (laughs) than uh, the equal-tempered scale that we know so well. Okay. And I've I've composed one piece with it. It's called Purity. It's part of my collection, my set called Klang Tint. I love the sound of it. And uh, we had a symposium. A number of us composers around the world had a symposium devoted to the Boland Pierce scale in Boston about 10 years ago, and that was a very successful event. So there are a number of people that are working with many interesting microtonal scales, and Boland Pierce is one of them. 
Well, it's interesting that you talk about it as having both a melodic and a harmonic thing. Sometimes the microtonal stuff may work on a melodic level, but gets a little strangled when you try doing harmonic work with it. So it's, is this scale uh, particularly useful for doing harmonic work? Yeah. In chordal yeah, if you, if you hear my piece, Purity, it opens with the melodic session and then it becomes uh, harmonic. Oh, interesting. You said that's on Clung Tint? Clung Tint, yes. That, oh, okay. That's um, on, a, on a CD that was put mm -hmm. out by the CC Mix in Paris. It's on Mode Records. It's called... Uh, what is it? New music from Paris, I think. CC oh, okay. mix. Okay. And I'm uh, putting it out also in, on vinyl with a Dutch company. Right. They're called Slow Scan. Oh, very good. Yeah, because it, one of the things that's interesting to me is is some of the time frames you work work on. I mean, you know, talking about working with the granular thing from the point where you were able to get an experiment that worked to the point where you came up with what you felt like was a useful compositional technique being yeah. a 20 year time period yeah 24 um, years yeah that's that's a that's a kind of interesting thing because so often in electronic music you know things are measured in sort of like micro weeks you know <laughs> from from one uh implementation of a thing to the next and so it's it's actually really interesting to think about a technique or a concept or in this case you know a scalar uh, compositional tool that is allowed a 10-year period to develop from a conference to you know possible possibly a released expression that's pretty that's actually it's maybe refreshing to hear that things can have that level of depth to them yeah my time scale of composition also is very long uh, I have a completed a couple of pieces uh, in December that I've been working on since I arrived here at, in Santa Barbara in 1996. Wow. Yeah, my projects tend to be very long, and, and it's partly due to uh, the fact that I'm not just working on music. I don't work on music every day. I haven't worked on music since December. It's now July. I'm working on two books right now. I'm working on the Computer Music Tutorial Revised Edition for MIT Press. Okay. That's a massive project. I'm having to go through the, all of the literature in the field since 1993 and update the book. Wow. And then I'm also finishing, well, I'm not finishing, but I'm working on a book called Foundations of Modular Synthesis. That's based out of the, the course that, it, that I've been teaching in modular synthesis. And I'm going to, I brought into that project Michael Hedrick, who oh, yeah. um, some of your listeners probably know. Yes. So let's talk a little bit about your music creation process because uh, I I can't even imagine what what are the kind of tools that you use. Do you literally write all your own tooling for doing the work, and what is your process of compiling and editing an end result? Because again, since you tend to really be focused on extremely small time frames and extremely precise change, it strikes me that that you are not going to be well served by, you know, Pro Tools and, and the Waves plugins, right? Oh, well, nothing wrong with Pro Tools and Waves plugins. And, you know, I, I'll use anything and everything. But, yeah, you, often what I will do is uh, I've developed a number of my own tools for granulation and for pulsar synthesis. So I use a program called Pulsar Generator. Uh, that runs on an old computer, and I use another program called Emission Control that I developed with David Thal, and that runs on an old computer. I also use my Constant Q Granulator, written in Super Collider 1, that runs in a, on, on my own computer, so on an old computer. So I often use those kinds of tools to start off with in terms of granular and particle processes. And then uh, I'll put them into something like Pro Tools and uh, begin assembly. It's a long process. I mean, the, the, the problem is that in the first stage, you, it's, it's a lot of playful fun. It's really unguided by any plan. Uh, you're just playing with interesting sounds. And I make a bunch of sound files. Uh, I start trying to put them together. I reach impasses where I have this group of sound files that kind of work and then this group of sound files that work, but they don't connect. So then I have to go back 
to the level of sound synthesis and try to synthesize a bridge between these two parts. So I'm, I'm working, that's how I construct a macro structure. I, I have two disconnected parts. I go back to the sound structure level uh, and then come on, back, come on back up and look at the whole architecture and see, you know, what does it need next? So it's this, pro what I call multi-scale planning, mm -hmm. where you're constantly going down to the smallest details and then coming back up to the highest levels and going back and forth arbitrarily. Do you in any way like map this or score this stuff in order to maintain your focus or to predetermine a narrative for the work? Uh, sometimes a diagram will, or, or, or some diagrams will, will help me in the process, but I consider all of these structures to be, uh, as I write in the book, like temporary scaffolding. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll put, I'll, I'll make a sketch of what I want the work to be, but then something will happen and that's not what the work is. The work wants to go in a different direction. And so I let it go. I think there was this, when I worked at MIT, I would often work with composers who would try to imagine a sound and then try to come up with the code in Music 11 or C sound uh, for that sound. And it's almost impossible. Right. I think it, it, the, the idea that we have this, uh, we now have real time sound generation and so you can simply play with the parameters of a process until you get to a sound that is interesting. Mm -hmm. And you may not have come there by a plan, it's by experimentation. So there's a lot of improvisation in the early part of my compositional process. How often do you work with, with sound recordings versus purely generated sound? Most of my work recently has tend to be purely synthesis. Mm -hmm. um, but I have nothing against working with concrete sounds, and occasionally they'll. Uh, these two pieces that I finished in December had concrete sounds in them. Oh, they did. I don't, okay. You won't you won't hear them as concrete <laughs> sounds or transform, but. Well, having uh, having again having heard your work, I was, I was going to say I'm not sure that I would actually know when the cricket is squeaking, but exactly, <laughs> it's interesting to know it might be in there, right. <laughs> One of the things that often, you know, I, I have the opportunity to go to go to conferences like Seamus and ICMC and stuff, and oftentimes work that is that uses similar techniques uh, really, it almost demands a very particular listening environment. Oftentimes it's multi-speaker. It's often arranged in a very specific layout of speakers or whatever. I have never experienced your music in anything other than stereo, and it always seems like it is very well appreciated in stereo. Do you do work that's specifically for multi-channel? I know your one release was with Asphodel, so I would assume that you actually had an opportunity to interact with these multi-channel systems. But was that ever a part of what you were interested in, or were you mostly more focused on the technique and less on the and presentation. No, I think uh, spatialization in concert is very important, and I, I always request as many loudspeakers as possible. Oh, okay. Uh, at the venues and I've, at the ZKM, for example, about a year ago um, in Karlsruhe, w we played at the uh, the Klang Dome, and uh, we had forty eight uh, loudspeakers in that particular setup. And I brought in, I've developed a spatial spatialization program when you have more than eight or 12 or 16 speakers you can't really do the diffusion manually anymore mm -hmm. you need uh, algorithmic algorithmic assistance so my former student shaker ramakrishnan wrote a program called zirconium which is a spatialization program that uh, he was commissioned to write for the zkm and we've put a special together with shaker uh, we've put together a special front end to zirconium that I call spatial cords, and it's based on my theory of spatialization. And we used it uh, in Graz, Austria, and we used it in Karlsruhe. We've used it in the Allosphere here at UCSB, which where we have a 54.1 system, and I found that very effective. It's It provides real-time interaction? Yes. I'm controlling the movement of one to many stereo pairs okay. um, moving throughout uh, the virtual space. Uh, okay. And uh, I, can I can determine the rate at which they move and the distance, how far apart they are. 
Um, but there's a random element that uh, the algorithm incorporates where I don't know exactly where it's going to put them. I just can control how close they are and at what speed they'll be moving. And I basically press a button and say, do it now. Uh-huh. And, it does, and it does it. And then my I know my music very well. So I know where the phrase boundaries are. And so the spatial choreography is linked to the phrase boundaries. So, for example, oh, when I come to a cadence the sound will stop moving. And then when the sound picks up again, it will start moving. I see. Uh, so what you're saying is that this zirconium and, and this uh, sound chords thing, uh, this this actually abstracts you from the number. Because when you first said, I ask for as many speakers as I can get, I was like, well, yeah, but then you have this whole mapping of point sources to locale. But this sort of like abstracts that from the you source. You solves that problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah interesting. Very cool. That's that's amazing. So when you when you perform your music, what is it that you're actually performing then? Because you obviously can't do these minute edits. No. Um, but you're obviously very actively playing the work. What is what is it that you're playing? Is it is it the spatialization or do you have other tools that you also interact with? No, it's primarily the spatialization. Okay. Um, and, I mean, I may EQ each piece slightly differently for a given space, but it's the sound projection. And I have specific techniques uh, for moving the sound around, but it is spontaneous. Uh, but I know, again, I know the music very well. I know when this phrase mm-hmm. is going to begin and where it's going to end. And so I make things move on phrase boundaries. Sure. And people seem to uh, appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. It adds another element. It's it's like the visuals of Brian O'Reilly. It adds another element. It, the music doesn't need that. You can listen to it in stereo, and it's I, I love the stereo medium. But when you have 8 or 16 or 24 loudspeakers in a hall, yeah, let's play with it. Right. Now we're already getting, I can't believe we're already getting close to the end of our time. But before we before we go, I want to talk a little bit about your teaching and your influence on students over the years. I mean, you have a long history of being, of influencing people in this world. I mean, going all the way back to sort of like co-founding the ICMC, you've long been involved, you were long involved with the Computer Music Journal, which was, you know, such such elemental uh, information for so many of us that that kind of came up into the computer music world. And you're still an active teacher. Uh, in fact, you know, talking now about working with Michael on, on putting together these uh, uh, this work on doing modular synthesis. What is it that draws you towards education as opposed to just research? Well, um, First of all, I think, you know, I, I did, I, I usually, my educational work generally comes out of my book writing work. You know, I taught the computer music tutorial for many years before the book came out. I see. I, I, te- I taught microsound before that book came out. I taught composing electronic music before that book came out. So the teaching is very much related to my writing. So I want to have something to say. So I, I, I write a book. And that's the foundations of modular synthesis. Okay. You know, what do I have to say about modular synthesis? Let's write a book and find out. It's interesting that uh, you know modular synthesis is making making such a strong comeback, and I think it's it's really great to know that you're going to have your finger on on that pulse. But w- in many ways, it's sort of like classic techniques there. What can you bring to it that's going to be new? Because one of the things I would say is all your writing always introduces new stuff. What do you think that you can bring to uh, the modular world that's going to be new? Well, the modular world is a is a different way of working with sound. I think it's a very it's a technique that um, leads you in unforeseen directions. It's it's very much like, I mean, I would make an analogy to the program Metasynth, the graphical synthesis program. Yeah. Uh, if you think you know what kind of sound you're going to make with <laughs> with medicine, good luck. It's a matter of uh, you know connect some patch chords together and see what happens. It's see a very experimental method. Right. So I can't predict what new things I'm going to find with uh, modular synthesis. The other thing I would say is that again, your your most recent book, the uh, composing electronic music. I I find 
I love the book because what I can do is I can sit down with it and just kind of read through a couple of pages and it'll spur something, right? And I think that that's, that's maybe where the modular world is open to is, is you can, you can think, you can present an idea or you can imagine an idea and it'll spur you into an action, right? And maybe that's one of the things that is most helpful with any kind of, uh, with any kind of like teaching text is the ability to spur people into activity, right? Well, I was just thinking about, you know, one possibility with modular. I mean, you've got the machine sitting in front of you and you've got a clock module and you've got the possibility of, of multiple asynchronous self-modulating clocks. Play with it. You know, it's just it's right there in front of you. I don't know what it's going to make, but that's an interesting <laughs> musical possibility. Absolutely. Right. Well, Curtis, this has been uh, an amazing opportunity for me to talk to you, hear, hear about your background, but also kind of like dive into the way that you think about things. It's, it's fascinating to me. Um, for people who'd like to know more about your work, where can they, where can they get the books? Um, where can they experience your music? And how can they learn more about, about, about your work? Well, uh, I have a new website coming online called curtisroads.net. I will have links to all of the above at that site. Great. All right, fantastic. Well, we'll be looking forward to that. Uh, I'm looking forward to this uh, this Blu-ray disc I happen to have. I, I held on to my... I still have VHS recorders because they're <laughs> I have important VHS tapes that I have to watch every once in a while. But um, I'll be looking forward to that release uh, just to, to hear, hear the work and see your interactions with Brian O'Reilly. Um, I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to uh, these new books that are be coming online hopefully soon. Do you have any kind of time frame for those, perchance? Well, probably in the 2020 time frame. Okay, fantastic. Well, really looking forward to that. Um, I want to thank you so much for the time. This, this was fantastic and a lot of fun for me. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you very much. All right. Many thanks to Curtis for taking the time to have a chat. It was, uh, as you can tell, it was a really amazing experience for me. I got a chance to really bug him about a lot of stuff I was curious about, and it was excellent. Uh, I want to thank uh, the people that have supported us over the years, Synthtopia.com, uh, Cycling74, the folks over at Ableton. And I want to especially thank, again, our sponsor, Splice.com. Again, if you get a chance and you want to go give it a swing, uh, jump over there to splice.com slash artmusictech-music. That'll uh, let them know that you heard it from us, which is actually really kind of important. It helps uh, get those sponsors paying attention to us. I think we're doing important work. You obviously do too. Otherwise, you wouldn't have just spent an hour with me. So do me a favor. Reach out to splice.com slash artmusictech-music. And uh, let's let them know how much uh, they and their support means to you and to me. Thanks a lot, and we will see you next week. Bye.